uh, last uh, last episode of our Megaphone uh, 2021 webinar series, Activists Winning the Attention Economy Game. And I think we'll just start uh, and then everybody will join, uh, whether it's here or on Facebook, because we are also on Facebook uh, live. Uh, so uh, yes, welcome, welcome everyone. Um, this is our fifth and final week of our series. Um, uh, my name is Maya. Uh, I work for TechSoup Europe. Um, we are based in Warsaw, but obviously now we are all based in our apartments. Um, I will serve as your facilitator for today. Uh, with us also on the chat is uh, Anna Kuliberda, who is our amazing education uh, uh, coach for a lot of our uh, training activities. Uh, with us also is Kasia and Michał in the backstage who are uh, part of our amazing comms team. They will be monitoring our social media and everything that's going on on Facebook. Very briefly, and apologies for those who have heard this for the fifth time. Uh, what is a Megaphone? Uh, you might be wondering. Uh, Megaphone is a, is a conference that we do annually that we used to do face to face for about 100 activists from Central and Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Um, who are struggling uh, uh, in these times, uh, sometimes very difficult uh, for activists in uh, our part of the world. Um, and the goal, TechSoup's goal, TechSoup's mission is always to um, help activists get better at using technology in their daily work. So whether that is the environment, women's rights, uh, what have you, uh, to understand how technology can help us and how it can get, get us closer to our audiences. And um, get, in speaking of getting us closer to our audiences, Megaphone used to be a closed event. Uh, we could only organize it for 100 people. So that's where the idea of webinars came from, that we had such amazing experts uh, and uh, with such amazing knowledge to share that we wanted to bring it to a wider uh, uh, group of people. And uh, hence the uh, uh, idea for a webinar uh, a series. Um, that is open to everyone, that is recorded, you can watch it uh, uh, at your own pace later uh, when you have time. Uh, but speaking of amazing experts, uh, we are joined today by Bavesh Patel, um, who uh, is a um, facilitator, uh, trainer, coach, host, uh, uh, as he likes to uh, use many of those labels. Um, I recently only find out, found out that it's also, your uh, Bavesh is also a gardener, we can talk, get into that later. Um, but Bavesh is also an expert in complexity. Uh, he uh, t talks to people about it. He tries to help us understand the complex, re complex realities we all live in. And today we'll focus on uh, how, what role in those complex realities do stories play and how we all live in them and how we can shape them in order to um, sort of explain the world to ourselves and to our audiences. Um, so hope you enjoyed this last episode. Uh, feel free to go, go back to the previous four ones. We'll be, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, sending them to you um, uh, via email. Thank you email that you will receive tomorrow. And uh, literally last sentences from me. Uh, Bavesh, Bavesh's presentation will take about 40 minutes after which we'll have a Q&A session. But if you have questions throughout uh, uh, Bav's presentation, please put them in the chat. We'll be monitoring it, we'll be copy pasting uh, uh, the questions and then choosing the ones we'll, we'll ask uh, Bavesh in the end. Uh, as you've, uh, the, the same goes for people who are watching us on Facebook. If you have questions, please put them there. We'll just uh, uh, copy them from, from the chat. Uh, you are all muted, you will stay muted throughout, uh, but please feel free to uh, engage with us, say hi, uh, ask, comment uh, uh, through, through chat. Uh, and last thing, we will be recording this. Uh, you will receive a link to the recording in the email as well as other resources in the email uh, you'll get uh, tomorrow um, in the afternoon. And now enough from me, uh, Bab, the floor is yours. Great, yeah, thank you, Maya. Um, so I think Maya gave, uh, gave a, a good enough uh, description, uh, maybe just to say I'm, I'm standing here in Moldova um, in, in my, in my uh, apartment, uh, in my kitchen, uh, as you can see. Um, it's spring, the weather's lovely. I've, I've managed to get my annual haircut, so that should last me a year. 
Um, and as Maya said, I, I these days I seem to spend a, a, a lot of time in that abstract world of strategy, um, working with different organizations and um, community-based, international, um, trying to trying to support them understand how, yeah, how do you think about strategy and how do you think about um, impact and, and how do you plan uh, when the world feels so um, unpredictable and uncertain. So um, yeah, that's where I spend a lot of my time. So um, I'd like to share a little bit about uh, some of my, let's say, explorations around the use of stories. Um, I think stories is like the latest trend. So there's like loads of stuff you can find about stories, storytelling, um, narrative. So um, I wouldn't really call myself an expert in this area, but I've certainly been experimenting for a while. So um, yeah, so just want to share with you some, some different thoughts. So uh, let me move to my next slide. So yeah, for the previous webinars have covered already a lot of practical stuff. Um, I, I hope I can focus maybe in uh, other ways of working with stories, um, some kind of big ways uh, and also some some small ways. Um, so, you know, uh, it could be the big ones or the small ones that interest you. Um, it's a webinar, so feel free if you're listening attentively, if you're lying on your sofa, if you're cooking while listening. I do all of those things when, uh, <laughs> when I attend webinars. So um, I hope some part of it's useful. Um, and just to recognize some of my influences, and I, I think we'll be sending some, some resources afterwards. Some of my influences include Cynthia Kurtz, who's done some amazing work on participatory narrative inquiry, and, and she shares all her work um, open source. And uh, David Anderson Hooker and, and a few others, uh, I think I'll, I'll send references after. So, well, let's dive in. So I wanna start with this really big idea that we are homo narrens. Um, we're homo sapiens, but we're also homo narrens. And that kind of means that we are fundamentally uh, storytellers. Stories shape how we understand the world. Uh, stories shape how we communicate. Um, stories shape how we've been sharing knowledge since the beginning of time. So stories are kind of so fundamental um, to who we are. Um, that we can, you know, you can look this term up, homo narrens. Um, and this picture, you know, it's such a simple question. So what do you do? And then sort of behind each person is just that huge amount of stories that come together to, to be able to answer that question of, uh, so what do you do? The stories, uh, we create the world through stories and, and we give meaning to the world and, and our world through our, through our stories. Um, I like this quote, the universe is made of stories, not of atoms. Now, I wanna be clear, I'm not, uh, of course, saying that literally uh, <laughs> the universe is made of stories. Of course, there is a world that already exists. So I'm, I'm not kind of talking about magic or, or something like that. Um, or, although it's interesting to think about the word spell and spelling and the use of language to create, but that, that's another topic. Um, what, what I wanna focus on is about how uh, stories and particularly, particularly narratives and the dominant narrative make some things more possible for some people and makes some things less possible for some people. So we're going to start with some big picture stuff, um, and then and then zoom into some some smaller stuff. So I better use a couple of definitions because some of you will be wondering. Okay, I use the word story. I use the word narrative. Is is there a difference there? So I'd say we all know what stories are. Their stories are like what we tell each other, what happened to us yesterday. Um, stories can also be cultural stories and myths. They have a, depending on which culture you're from, they have a start, a middle and an end. So, so I, I would say, I, I think, you know, how you understand story is, is probably the way I understand story. So what's narrative? Um, but for me, narrative is like a template that holds together certain stories to give a bigger meaning. So just to repeat that, it's a, tem a narrative is a template in which there are many stories and together those stories give a bigger meaning. 
So to give a very typical one, there is a narrative of how boys should be and how girls should be. And that fits a particular template within which some stories fit and other stories don't fit. And it's not trying to say whether something is true or not, but it's more about what is the dominant narrative or template about how boys should be and girls should be, and therefore which stories does it allow to exist and which stories don't fit in and so they get denied. So, so that's what a narrative is. It's, it's something that, that, let's say, controls the types of stories that, that show up. Now, uh, I'm gonna use a, a model here from Ken Wilber. Um, it, it, again, he sort of divides the world in, a, in an interesting way. And so um, using this model, just to recognize that stories, um, they shape our individual internal world. So our identity, mindset, values. Um, if I asked you, hey, who are you? You know, they're, 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 they're probably stories that you'd tell to be able to, to talk about who you are. If I asked you, hey, what's important to you? You might name some values and then tell me a few stories about those values in action. So, so we use stories as a way of understanding ourselves, identifying ourselves, um, identifying our values. At the same time, stories also shape uh, our behavior. So how I am um, in the UK, which is, which is uh, where I was born and lived for half of my life, um, and how I behave in Moldova, uh, some things are the same, but actually some things are different um, in a very simple way. Uh, as a brown skinned person, I'm kind of less aware of that when I'm walking down the streets in Manchester. Somehow I'm just a little bit more aware of that when I'm walking along the streets of Chisinau. And to some extent that starts to change my behavior. And so what are the stories that are being told that even unconsciously then shape my behavior in a particular way? Then uh, as I start to talk about behavior, of course, the word culture comes in. So what are the stories that over time start to form cult the cultures we live in or the multiple cultures that we live in? And again, those cultures kind of te tell us, you know, what are the values of a particular society? And then ultimately, uh, stories in a way also shape laws, structures, and the policies uh, of a particular country. Now, I don't know if that, that sounds strange, but, but if, you, if, you, if we take the narrative um, of the planet, you can see how if you go back 30 or 40 years, yeah, the narrative of the planet was that I think it was, you know, abundant and uh, you know constantly renewing itself and we can use all these resources as much as we want because you know maybe they're for us as human beings and so you saw that laws and structures and policies allowed us to use and, and, and abuse the environment as much as we wanted. Now the narrative around the planet as you all know has radically changed and because the story of how we understand the planet has changed, it starts to shift the laws, the policies and the structures. Um, of course, then we come into questions of those who are in power and maybe profit from some of those structures and so don't want those laws to change. But I think we can recognize that the narrative around the planet, uh, about the planet ha has changed. So it's just recognizing that underneath all of these things, um, I'm, let's say, I'm putting forward a hypothesis that uh, why pay attention to stories? Because stories actually shape the world we live in, not in a kind of uh, soft way, but ultimately in the laws, the structures, the policies, as well as the, the values and beliefs um, that we all live in. Are, are shaped by stories, um, which is why I think it's so important to, to pay attention to them. Now, how does the dominant narrative work? Well, this is one way that it works. So if your story fits in with the dominant narrative, then that in a way creates a sense of uh, belonging. And that means that 
your story and stories like yours inform the development of society. That includes culture, policies, laws, and also those stories then enter the narrative. And once they enter the narrative, they can then be referenced. So they form the kind of body of knowledge, the stories we tell ourselves. Now, the interesting thing is when your story does not fit, instead of a sense of belonging, it, it creates a sense of othering. So you, you are this other as opposed to belonging. Now, because of that, it means that these stories that do not fit, they don't inform the development of society, culture, policies, et cetera. And then they don't therefore enter the narrative. And now if they don't enter the narrative, it means they cannot be referenced. And there is a concept that I'm exploring still, so I'm kind of new to it, but I'm finding it really interesting. And it's this idea of uh, epistemic injustice, which is kind of recognizing uh, injustice related to knowledge and ways of knowing. And this idea that if your story has not been included and therefore is not part of the narrative and therefore can't be referenced, it's very easy to deny your knowledge or your way of knowing because it doesn't seem to be there, but there's a reason that it's not there. So um, anyway, it's <laughs> although the term sounds a bit big, um, it's quite interesting to explore epistemic uh, injustice. So that is in a way, one of the ways that, that the dominant narrative operates and then keeps itself dominant. Like what is it that, that keeps it dominant? So how does the dominant narrative then change? So um, some of you may, may or may not have come across this. It's a guy called Kuhn and he was talking about paradigm shifts. And so I'm gonna use his model to talk about uh, the dominant narrative and how that can shift. So um, you can ignore like normal science and model, just, just use the other words. So, so we've got the, the dominant narrative or you can say, uh, the, the dominant narrative uh, creates the, let's say, normal way of seeing things. Then as the dominant narrative is challenged, alternative narratives challenge it and, and this dominant narrative starts to drift. So from its very stable position, it just starts to drift a bit in its uh, stability. And then if it's challenged even more, it goes from drifting to the dominant narrative starts losing its dominance. So it goes into a crisis. So the dominant narrative is now in crisis. From crisis, it can start to lose all its credibility, which is the moment you're, you've moved from crisis into a revolution or, or a change. And then eventually and hopefully a new narrative starts to become the dominant one. And that that becomes um, a kind of paradigm shift and moves to, you know, as some people say, the new normal. Now, how is that useful? Um, if you are working on changing a particular narrative, whether that's, you know, at a community level, at a, a national, regional, even global level, um, to, to really think about at what stage is the narrative that you were trying to change? Like wh where is it on this cycle? And therefore, depending on where it is, um, what strategy might you use to change it? So um, there was, and someone will, I think uh, Maya or Anna will put the link in the, in the chat. There was a webinar, I think it would have been last week or the week before, but, but it was someone called Val. I hope, I hope that's correct. Uh, be interesting if Val, Val's on, on this webinar. So I was listening to that and, she gave a few interesting social media strategies and I connected them to this model. Now, now I don't know whether Val would agree with this, but um, what listening to Val, this is, this is the way I understood it. But one of the strategies is, is educational. So if the dominant narrative is starting to drift, starting to lose its stability, then maybe some more educational information can help those cracks in, in the narrative start to get wider. So educational information uh, could be a strategy. Then from drift, the dominant narrative moves into crisis. Now, if it moves into crisis, 
crisis basically means people are starting to wonder, hey, what, what should I believe here? So there's the dominant narrative, but actually, you know, there are these alternative views that are also making sense. The moment someone starts to think about what they should believe, it's a values question. They're, what is it that they're going to value? Because what they used to value seems to be in crisis. And so here you can appeal to, to values. And then from crisis, uh, action has started and you're already moving into a revolution or the dominant narrative is starting to lose all credibility. And so here's the opportunity to invite action as more and more people come together to, to kind of, you know, get rid of this old uh, dominant narrative and try and replace it. And, and finally, as the new narrative starts to become dominant um, and more people are on board, possibly reactive content is, is one way to get attention. So um, now I'm not saying this is the only way. I'm sure you can use all of these strategies all of the time. Um, but yeah, I would be interested to hear what, what Val has to say, because it seems some of the strategies she was suggesting kind of fit also this way of seeing how, uh, how we change a dominant narrative and, and what, the, what the stages might be uh, and what the strategies might be. So I, I'll just pause there to give, to give you a chance to think about it. And, and just to ask the question, what are the, no, where are the narratives you are trying to change so uh what, whatever particular change you, you are working on at a community level or a, a country regional level where are they are they are they you know still stable and stuck are they starting to drift and crack open um are those narratives uh, in in a crisis uh, has the revolution already happened so so yeah pl please use the chat just to share which, which narratives are you working on trying to change, uh, whether you call them narratives or not? Um, and where are they? Where are they in this model? So I'll, I'll just pause for a minute just to also uh, give your brain a rest and give my mouth a rest, and then I'll, I'll continue. Okay. So that was kind of uh, fairly big stuff, it's fair to say. So um, I'd like to move to what I'm calling the small stuff. And I, I guess I just mean the scale of the work. Um, and I'd like to share with you some principles about working with stories. And with each one, I'll share one practice, but you can, I'm sure, come up with others. Um, and just to say, most of my work is facilitating groups. So I work with stories that, that people tell. Um, and I'm assuming some of you, maybe many of you are also engaged with communities and, and their stories. Um, so I'll share maybe three or four practices and then I'll see if there's a time at the end just to share one, one very specific example. So the first principle, let, let's say you're, you're in a situation where you're engaging with um, a community, you're engaging with a group, and you want to work with stories. So one of the first uh, questions is, who is asking the story? And maybe this is an obvious one, context matters. So who are you who is asking the story? Uh, what's the context in which the story is being asked? Uh, what's the power relationship? Um, it could be a money relationship. Are, are you a project manager or a donor um, who's asking for the story? Um, are you a stranger to a particular community? Um, what's the language being used? So all of these things shape the context. And it's just recognizing that the storyteller will offer a story that fits the context. So the story told is a response to the perceived context, meaning before the storyteller has even opened their mouth, so much has already been shaped in their minds based on the context that they're perceiving within which they're now being invited to share, share their story. So we can go in quite unconsciously or we can try to really pay attention to, to the context before even the person opens their mouth because the context will shape their response. Um, 
So what's one thing you, you, one or two things you can do about that? So, so one, for example, is you can train people from the same community to ask for those stories. So if, when I say train, I mean, if you need to collect them in a particular way, or, you know, that you have a particular process of, of capturing stories. So um, the key, there may be other ways. The key point is what can you do to make the storyteller feel uh, free and, and natural uh, uh, to be able to share, share their story as if they're just sitting around uh, sharing it to the person next to them. So how to create that? I won't use the word safety. I will just say how to create that naturalness of context so, so that the storyteller feels comfortable to share the story how they would like to share it and not share the story in a response to the context that they're perceiving. I'll just give a, <laughs> one example of this, which I'm in right now. Uh, I was asked by one organization to work with their strategy. Um, and then they asked me to interview uh, 22 people uh, in their organization. So my first reaction was, well, no, uh, why don't I design a way for you to all interview each other? And then we can have a workshop where we can bring together all of that interview data. You can make sense of it and we can use that for strategy. And the response was, no, we want you to do it. That sounds like it's going to take too much time. So I had to really think about it. And I thought, OK, OK, I will do it. But then the, the data I will collect will still have a workshop and look at it together. So they said, OK, but just think about that situation. So. I've been hired by the boss of the organization to interview 20 of the staff about various questions related to strategy. And I'm an external person. So just, you can just think about, you know, how are they perceiving me? Maybe some are gonna be open, maybe some are gonna be right. Well, you know, the boss is gonna hear about whatever I say. So, you know, I better be careful. Uh, have I, have I been sent in with an agenda or not? You know, you can imagine all sorts of questions that now can be asked about um, the context. Um, and I'm, I'm in the middle of this uh, process now. And if I'm honest, I'm still going, hmm, not sure I, I would do this again. Um, but I'm experimenting anyway with, with this interview process. So, so anyway, that's one principle. Who is asking for a story? And um, to really take the context seriously. Second one, how are you asking for a story? So when we ask a direct question, the person or the storyteller usually constructs an answer. So they maybe can kindly gift you the answer that they think you're looking for because you seem nice and they seem nice and you know maybe they wanna please you, but you know they, they wanna gift you the answer. Or maybe they're trying to guess which answer you are looking for, or they maybe know what answer you're looking for. Uh, and so they give you that one instead. So a direct question can both limit how the person responds and also can, can kind of lead to this uh, um, uh, constructing of an answer that the person thinks you are looking for. So here's, here's a very typical example. Uh, can you tell me a story of the impact of our project on your community? You, you've run a particular project in a community and now you're collecting stories to discover the, the impact. Um, and you can just imagine, uh, based on what we said before, um, all the things that are underneath in the context there. So uh, what can we do about this uh, challenge of how are, you, uh, uh, how are you asking for a story? So um, try to ask indi an indirect question that might invite a more open response because the person doesn't know what you're looking for because it's, it's indirect. It also means they may share more unexpected and useful data because they're not trying to answer a direct question. You're trying to get them to share more openly. And maybe you do not know what you are looking for. So um, as many of you know, when you're working in complex environments, um, 
whatever project you've run, it's not always easy to then understand what has been the impact uh, of your project. So sometimes you don't even know what you're looking for. So here's an alternative. So I shared at the top, can you tell me a story of the impact of our project on your community? Okay, it's one way to ask it, very direct. Uh, here's a, a kind of more softer, open way of asking the same question indirectly. So if you met an old friend from another community and they asked you, how is your community doing in the last year? What story would you tell them? Right, so you can see how the question just kind of leaves it a little bit more open. It's not directly saying, I want to know the impact of my project. It's not trying to point towards positive change or, or, or something negative. It's indirectly still inviting the person to reflect in the direction that you want them to, to, to respond in, but you're not you know, giving them a sort of clear goal in a way by sort of saying, tell me the positive impact. Um, so um, again, this principle is, it's again connected to the last one, but how you, so how you first show up the context and then how you actually ask for a story can have massive uh, implications for then what story is, um, is shared. The third one, what is the meaning of the story? So you've uh, collected stories, um, and then what we usually do uh, is we collect stories, we, we then, the story collector, whoever we are, analyze them and then produce whatever, some report, some key points, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe we're trying to prove something that our project was useful. Um, the, the interesting thing is, uh, even though we're collecting stories, stories are the top of the iceberg. So I'm using the iceberg metaphor that, you know, there's a little bit of the iceberg above that you can see that that's the story. And then there's a whole huge piece of the iceberg that you don't see. And the story, which is the top of the iceberg, has a deep meaning in the life of the storyteller, because uh, you know that's a story from their life that only the storyteller knows. So I'll just repeat that. Only the storyteller knows the real meaning of the story they've told. Of course, you've got your understanding of it, but only the storyteller really knows its meaning or its um, significance. So what can you do? Uh, very simply, uh, might sound a bit strange, after telling the story, ask the storyteller, what is the meaning of their story? Um, it's as simple as that. And you might be surprised what meaning they assign to it. So I'll just repeat that. Once you've invited a story and, and maybe you've captured it, to then actually ask the storyteller. So thank you for sharing that story. And can you tell me uh, what's the meaning of that story for you? You know, why share that story? And so you're inviting the storyteller to kind of step uh, sideways to their own story, look at it and go, well, you know, I'm telling you that because it's significant or the meaning is this. And maybe sometimes you would have predicted that, but I think a lot of times if you ask that question, uh, you might be quite surprised what the meaning is, which is very different to collecting lots of stories, going away, and then you doing that analysis, uh, you, using whatever method. Um, and and um, I'll share when, when we send some information later, there are a number of approaches to this now and related software um, that allow you to capture hundreds or thousands of stories and, uh, and some of them are, are open source methods as well. Uh, I think this is the last one. So we tell stories that make sense to us. So obviously <laughs> uh, we like linear stories. Uh, we like to tell stories where this happened and this happened and this happened so that they have a, a linear logic. I mean, if a story doesn't doesn't make sense, like why why would you tell it? Um, but without realizing, we often create stories that are actually advocating for our present position. So uh, I'll say that again. Wh wherever we are now, uh, and whatever we think is being asked, we then look back and collect the points that help us tell a story that actually advocates for our present. 
whether we whether we realize we're we're doing it or not and so we have uh, this bias for making connections between things to advocate for our present position and, and research has shown actually that how we think we did something and what happened can actually be quite different when we reflect back on it um, and, and one idea is if you can help people tell immediate stories or keep journals of things in real time, it's going to uh, be more useful in terms of what actually happened. When you ask someone a long time after the event to reflect back, you often get these stories that are more created for advocating for your present position rather than a story about kind of what actually happened uh, in the past. So um, how, how do we address this, uh, this kind of uh, pattern that we have for telling these well-constructed, coherent stories? Um, so one of, the, one of the, there's probably many ways to do this. Uh, what I try and do is I try and confuse the cause and effect logic to find stories that were left out. Uh, one of the ways to do this is jumping backwards and forwards in the story timeline so to give a very practical example i was again it's about strategy I, I was working with a group and we were exploring the last few years of their organizational work and so um i knew if i asked them okay just tell me the story then yeah they would just tell me this coherent story that made sense to them but i wanted to find out what about those stories that are being left out for whatever reason that don't fit the causal logic so what i did was i started anywhere and said okay here we are uh, two years ago T tell me a story from here about what was going on so people told the story and then i asked so what happened after that okay that sounds the uh, the usual way but then what i did was i said okay now tell me another story but tell it me before that point and then, oh okay that's a bit odd then they told me a story from here and then i said Okay, but now tell me another story of what happened from over here. Okay, and now tell me another story of what happened from over here. So because I kept jumping backwards and forwards in the timeline, they actually had to think more. Their brain woke up. I broke their usual script and they started producing stories that those stories were there, but they'd never shared them before or they were not part of the regular story. And so once we'd collected enough of these stories by jumping backwards and forwards, then I said, okay, now let's look at all these stories and, and now tell me that story. And suddenly their story of their last three years was a very different story. Yeah, not radically different, but was a very different story to the story I would have got if I'd have said, so what happened in the last three years? because then they would have just gone into their, their usual script. So uh, it's just, there's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's how we make sense of the world, but it's just recognizing that we have this causal bias and uh, it takes a little bit of extra uh, work or tricks even to kind of shake up that causal bias to kind of discover the interesting stories or, or even interesting information that that kind of sits um, just below the surface. So, uh, perfect, 35 minutes. I'll finish with this example uh, for some of my facilitation work, just to kind of make it a bit smaller and clearer how I use some of these principles. So, um, in this particular bit of facilitation, um, 40 people from community organizations from across uh, Europe. Western, Middle East, and Europe uh, were exploring how to be in a partnership together. And they were about to uh, start an 18 month partnership. Um, and so they were exploring how to be in partnership together. So we started and I split them into groups of five and I asked them to share stories of good partnership experiences and uh, gave them a time limit. Once everyone had shared a few stories, I asked them to capture their own key points on, on bits of paper and then leave them on the table. Then they formed new groups of five and they did the same. This time I asked them to share bad partnership experiences and capture the key points 
and then leave them at the table. So now uh, everybody's already moved uh, once, uh, and then I'm going to ask them to move again. And so I've got real stories captured. Um, the stories have been, um, the key points from those stories have been written by the people who told the stories, right? Um, but now they're not allowed to advocate for their own story because they've gone to another table and left their story behind. So I've got uh, eight tables, is that right? 40 divided by five, I think, eight tables. And on them, I've got these piles of key points from good stories and bad stories around partnership. So now they form new groups again of five. And this time they uh, took those key points on their table and they literally made duplicates of them. So now they had two piles uh, of stories and key points, um, both exactly the same. Then what happened was half of every table went to one side of the room, so that, that became one group. Half uh, of the tables went to the other side and that became another group. Both groups had the same data, right? So that's a key point. Both groups had the same data and that data had been generated by the group themselves through the stories that they told about good and bad partnerships. I then asked them to look at that data, to cluster it, to, to see where the similarities are, and basically to come up with partnering principles, whether they were good stories, whether they were bad stories, what is the partnering principle uh, underneath it? Um, and what happened was, is when both groups came back, uh, of course, well, I say, of course, uh, you may not have expected this, there were some points that were similar and some points that were, were different. And remember, they had the same data. They were just in two groups at the same data. And what we did was then we created a set of principles and where the similarities were, so both groups were saying, yeah, this is an important principle. Uh, they became core principles that, that this group were all saying, yeah, as a group, you know, as we move forward, these are core principles we want to follow when it comes to partnering. But probably even more important were the differences because the differences uh, or different principles allowed for more situationally dependent choices because some of these people were partnering across country across culture and so the differences uh, held the tension of needing to respond differently to different situations and uh, those principles came out of completely their own experience and, and their own storytelling and then their own meaning making of those stories, then their own sense making and clustering of those stories, and ultimately uh, them uh, giving those turning those stories in, into principles. Um, so a kind of key point uh, I'm trying to, to, I guess, make here is um, how conscious are we of uh, how much we get involved in the sense making of other people's stories. So we're all using stories, working with stories, et cetera. Um, but as a facilitator, for me, it starts to become a, an ethical question about how much I keep the meaning and sense-making of those stories in the hands of the storytellers, um, rather than me taking them and, and then, I don't know, using them as a, as a consultant to, to come up with something. Um, so oh, just to finish, uh, I'll finish with this quote, which I love. Uh, the universe is made of stories, not atoms. And how we engage with stories uh, in the smallest ways um, can ultimately actually have an influence um, on the biggest things. I think that's it. I'll stop there and I will stop sharing my screen. If I can manage that. Yes, I can. Yeah. Good, and that's 40 finish. minutes and 51 seconds as requested, Maya. Uh, this is amazing, amazing discipline, uh, <laughs> way better than mine with the introduction. So a, a professional facilitator, you can tell. Uh, no, everyone, yes, please, uh, please, if you have any questions to Bav, put them in the, uh, put them in the chat. Bav, thank you so much for these, uh, this pre presentation. Maybe, maybe I can start us off because I myself was wondering this. 
um, because you have a lot of um, you have a lot of uh, experience working with organizations. Uh, so like internally working with organizations. Yeah, internally. Yeah, true, true. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, uh, and this may be uh, sort of a banal question, but I think a lot of us are asking ourselves questions when it comes to storytelling, asking ourselves questions. How can we build uh, stories or, uh, um, you know, change the narrative, existing narratives when it comes to reaching wider audiences? So one thing is creating a story about what we do, the mission of the organization, how we think about the work uh, uh, that we're putting out. Um, but the other thing is, uh, and this is something I think a lot of us struggle with, is creating a, a, a story that it, that will uh, 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 defy this existing narrative, or that will uh, uh, you know gather larger audiences around our cause. And uh, have you had experience where these principles and uh, uh, um, you know translate to that? Meaning that from a process of working with an organization, then they also sort of apply that, or the principles can be applied to creating a, a sort of wider reaching narrative and story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I think the part that I'm not experienced in, I would say, just to be clear, but I think other webinars covered it, was was the point on scale. So you know, one of the main ways to scale now is yeah, through yeah. So social media. And as as you know, very scarily, I still have one of these. So you know, I can't I can't say much about about social media. Um, but um, in some of the projects I, I've been involved with. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just share this this concept because it sound, sounds strange. Um, faction, so not fact or fiction, but faction, right? And the and the idea is, um, can you start by collecting real stories, and then through those real stories, can you kind of create almost a, a meta story? But it's not invented; it's actually based on those real stories, right? But it is kind of fictional because you're taking elements of these different stories and then creating a story that it's not that it's ideal, but somehow it does give a, a clearer direction. And then it allows you to possibly ask the question, so how can we generate more stories like that? Right. And, and you can also create the opposite and then say, well, how can we have less stories like that as well? And so what that allows you to do, I think, um, and, and this comes back to kind of the question of strategy, is it's, it's much easier for people to read a story that they can really connect to and then to be able to go, yeah, how do you create more stories like that? Yeah, I, I think there's something I can do. You know, that's very different to going, that's our strategic objective. How do we go there? Oh, strategy, I, I don't know. So I think there's, there's something really interesting about if, if you're thinking about how you create stories, to really somehow use as many real stories as possible, um, not not to yeah I guess just construct a story, um, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, just to just to maybe root it in an example, if for example Tanya, uh, to answering your previous question, where where the narratives that they were trying to change are wrote that they're focusing on discrimination and stigmatization of vulnerable groups, such as previously incarcerated persons, people living with HIV, people using drugs. What you all often mention is basing stories in real stories. So do you have a good advice on how to sort of uh, get those stories? So in Tanya's case, would that be listening to their audiences and gather in gathering those stories and then based on those building a larger narrative? Yeah, so so I I haven't worked specifically in in those areas, uh, so I can't respond um, directly. But but just that I'm reading the chat as well. So so I, I guess my, my of course the first question is what is the story you're trying to change and who is the audience? So there's all those sorts of questions. So so the interesting thing here is um, all of those um, things mentioned, um, uh, those identity patterns are also part of stories, right? So then how can those stories also use other identity patterns to kind of shift that narrative a little bit? So, so someone, someone who's, for example, um, incarcerated. Um, so, okay, so, so they're in prison. Uh, so that's one story, but then they, they could be another story about a young man or a young woman who is in their early twenties, who hasn't had you know, certain opportunities. So suddenly you're, you're shifting the story to 
another identity of that same person that maybe people can connect to more. So, so it's sometimes about, about you, you know, we, we have this amazing, I mean, people are looking at me now. I don't know what they're imagining, but, but we have a wonderful way of boxing people. And then you suddenly say, oh, and, and by the way, Bab does ballet. And then for a lot of people, they go, oh, whoa, didn't, why didn't you expect that? So, so there's something about, you know, how do you shift, shift the other identities where stories can be told as well? So sometimes it, it's not just focusing on that particular identity, but maybe bringing in stories that are also other parts of a person's identity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I think that's helpful. Um, and do you yourself, do you have examples of well-told stories in, from the activist world, meaning the ones that follow those, uh, the, the rules that you mentioned and that, uh, that really do have that power and are built, built in real stories. Yeah, um, yeah, not not really, because I'm not I'm not really working. I think on that story construction side, but right. I am more working with the groups who are in that space of starting to create those stories and right. use them. Um, it might might sound awful, but I I often then disappear from the scene and never quite see years later where they went with that work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so then maybe if some some of the some of us who are working for for organizations and from from your experience, uh, like what is the from from the workshops and facilitation you do? Like what is the biggest shift when people are learning how to create stories? Like what is the moment that or like what is the biggest challenge for them? And when is the moment that they sort of uh, catch on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... I think I think I get your question. So I, I mean, I would say for me, the biggest shift has been um, seeing stories. Uh, and so, what? Why was my thing called "Ooh, ooh I spilt my story"? Um, so, seeing stories not as messes that have to be tidied up, but seeing stories more as as just complex, interconnected. Uh, things that we partially understand and that are changing all the time because without really understanding how how stories are the ways that we are deeply interconnected what happens as uh, as you start to work with stories is you want stories to be tidy it's like this is a story this is a story this is a story I now have five stories I will add them together now I have a super story this super story will change the world so so we come with this sort of mechanical way because you know we want things to be a bit neat and tidy and it's um th there's a whole concept around this called warm data and it's the idea of, of stories being deeply interconnected and alive so the data is warm because you're alive and and i'm alive and so the story's alive and it's how do you how do you feel how do you learn to feel comfortable stepping into working with stories um that are alive and that don't have clear edges and that are deeply interconnected. And so you work with stories, but you're always working with them from the inside. You're not sort of standing outside with your five boxes. So I think that that's one of the real, the real challenges with working with stories, because like, where, where, where do they end? I mean, you know, I could start telling you about my life and uh, depends how long the webinar is, I could carry on for years. I mean, you know, where, where is it? Where's the end and beginning of a story? So I think, I think that's a big challenge actually, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, how about, how does, because we've been living in this online reality for most of us for more than a year now, does the online context uh, influence the sort of working with stories or telling stories? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good question. I, I for me, I, I think it, I think it does. Um, but it's maybe not particularly about stories, but the fact that stories are the ways we connect as human beings. I think what's what's generally happened with with the shift to digital is is it's really challenged us to to kind of go like, what's it mean to be human online? So, so I was, so I was doing something with, with the Red Cross and they were like, um, how do we build trust online? And I was going, what do you really mean by that? And they said, well, 
actually most of our trust is built while we're drinking tea over lunch that's where like the real trust is built so we can have these official negotiations now we're all on zoom there's no tea there's no coffee and there's no lunch so what what were they really saying what they were really saying was it's the stories we tell each other in an informal way over over the in the informal parts like lunch and coffee is where real real trust is built so so i'm still trying to work this out but i think i think you know we we have to think about uh, the way we work online to create more informal spaces. Like, like you never go to a real meeting and just arrive, sit down, press a button and go, oh, I'm on, let's talk for an hour. Oh, I'm off. Like you arrive, you meet people, you talk to a few people, the meeting gets going and, and we're losing this informal space. And, and that in a way, means that we may be losing some of the things that build trust, make us human, et cetera. I think we can recover that, but we have to start thinking a bit a bit differently about how we use online meetings, at least for this year, I think, right? But it might get better next year. Yeah, I'm still, uh, I'm still sort of uh, hoping something in the fall can happen, but yeah. Uh, oh, you're very, you booked your trip to the Bahamas in the fall or something. Really no, out. never Bahamas, I'm like the Balkans. I would love to oh. go to the Balkans. <laughs> it's not, it's, I'm thinking small or anywhere Central Eastern Europe is, yeah. uh, I'm good with as long as there's about like maybe 40 people yeah. <laughs> from other countries there. Um, no, okay. If anyone has any uh, other questions, then this is this is the time to to ask Bav. Um, we will, uh, Bav, if that's okay with you. Apart from uh, the recording and the the presentation, we will share your yeah. contact information. Uh, so if anybody wants to reach out directly, that will be uh, that will be possible. Maybe with some follow up because this was. Do something that we definitely have to sort of digest and think about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, then I think that might be also an option for uh, for everyone. Yeah, yeah. And I'll add loads of references into my final slide when I send them to you. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, but if if there are no more questions, then <clears throat> I'm so sorry. Something happening with the with the voice for the last one. Um, I would like to thank Bav so much for uh, for doing this. I think this is. The, the the storytelling has become such a buzzword, meaning that we all know that we have to do it, but uh, also looking at it from a perspective of not just creating stories for our audiences, but the way that we are all emerged in, emerged in them and how we, we work with them every day is, is, is also very inspiring yeah. and something we should think about more in our in our daily work. Uh, so thank you for uh, for pointing that out. Uh, thank you to everyone who participated, uh, not just in this one, but also in the uh, in the whole series. Um, like I mentioned, we will be sending the link to the recording, the slides, uh, additional materials from BAP in the email as alongside uh, recordings to the uh, previous webinars. Um, and uh, yes, hopefully, hopefully we will be able to meet face to face sometime in the not so distant future. Uh, if not, then uh, there for sure will be another webinar series uh, probably <laughs> next year. Um, but yes, thank you so, so much. And uh, I hope this was useful and you can um, you can use it in your uh, in your daily work and somehow make it easier or better or thanks to it, reach more um, more audiences and get more followers for our causes because they're all um, changing the world, right? That's the, that's the hope. So thank you, thank you everyone so much and uh, uh, see you some, somewhere along the road. Thanks Maya, thanks everybody. Thanks for coming and listening, take care. Thank you, bye-bye.